Hi there, come on in. Told you last week we were gonna put on this show a feature on shooting, but we don't have any room. On Monday, we went ice fishing with European style fishing expert Craig Scoff on a day when other anglers reported fishing was slow, but we caught loads of fish. It wasn't the private farm pond that made the difference. It was the small hooks, tiny larva for bait, and extremely sensitive bobbers that allowed us to detect the almost imperceptible bites of bluegill on this day. We'll show you this super ice fishing technique, catch you up on outdoor news and a lot more, so stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. About the fourth to there. Yep. Yep. <laughs> God, that, I feel so good when I outfox him on that. Do you think it's going to be pretty good? I think so. Temperature, four degrees, no wind. We're on a very small farm pond looking for bluegills. In drilling our ice fishing holes, Craig Scoff already saw some promising signs in this little one acre farm pond. When we're out here fishing on these farm ponds, the first thing you want to do is cut a lot of holes because when you're in a small pond, the fish tend to spook real easily. And after I cut my holes, then I'll take my time to set my tackle up. Usually they'll calm down by then. But these farm ponds can be the best fishing, but uh, we'll have to see what the, how this one produces for us. Well, you know, the first holes you cut, you can see around the holes, muck you brought up because it, it was real shallow. Yeah, exactly. When I put my auger down in there, it would bring it up. Over there, it was quite shallow. When we got over here, this looks like it's about five, six foot. Well, so. let's see. Here, I can run a test here. <laughs> let's see. With the cane, it goes right down to the horn. So, <laughs> so that's how deep. So, so that's plenty deep here. Yeah. The the key thing in these ponds, especially with this thin ice, I mean, it's in yeah, most lakes right now. Let's see how thick that ice is. Oh, that isn't too bad. That's about it's not too bad. Four inches, maybe. Yeah, but in most lakes right now, we you know we got a foot of ice. This is a good sign in a pond if you've got thin ice at the time of year because it, it shows that there's spring water coming in somewhere mm -hmm. and it also shows there's plenty of oxygen for the fish. It's not going to freeze to the bottom, so if it's, if it's only five foot deep, you don't have to worry about a winter kill. Mm -hmm. So this should be a good pond. Okay, well, let's, let's get the rods rigged up. What do you All have right. here? Oh, I've got a little bit of everything in my bag of tricks. If the bluegills in this pond are the slightest bit hungry, Craig Scoff says his European fishing techniques will catch them with extremely small hooks and lightweight floats. This is a, one of the new floats for this year. It's called a mini shy bite. You can see the thin, thin stem at the top. It's mm -hmm. made for uh, if you want a, a float that's rigged right fixed to the line if you're going to hand line your fish. Now you have this, of course, you, you'll slide it. Yes. Right on that yep. rubber thing, mm -hmm. but you have small weights here. And what size is that hook? Is that that a 14? That's, oh, that's about a probably a 14 or a 16. I'm gonna have to change that hook. Uh, we'll probably use something. This is a friend's rod, and he he was using an eyed hook here. I'm gonna use a snelled hook hmm. that doesn't have an eye. The reason for that is when a bluegill takes a bait in his mouth with an eyed hook on it, that eye hits the front of the mouth when you when you set the hook, and it actually bursts the mouth open. That's why the Europeans use spade end flat headed hooks. So when they set the hook, it doesn't do that. And that's important. I, this, people, this little eye here? That little eye will burst the mouth open when you go to set the hook. Yes, it is a problem. Well, I tell you, I, I'd say that Craig was full of it. <laughs> <laughs> if he didn't catch fish like crazy, which he does with these rigs. Yep. Are you gonna use maggots for bait? Yeah, we'll use maggots, yep. Well, I'll, I'll dig out a pole here too. Yeah, we gotta get rigged up here, yeah. These are the number 18 eyeless snelled hooks. Snelling means that the line is wound around the shank rather than being tied through the eye, which makes for a stronger knot on this one pound test line. A very important point to remember when you're using fishing line, it's not, I don't believe it's so much the visual of the, the heavy line versus the small line. If you, t if you took this one pound test, there's just a breeze blowing here. If you took one pound and 10 pound next to each other, even four pound, and I was to blow on them, the one pound is gonna go a lot further than the four pound. When a big bluegill comes up to your bait and inhales it, if it doesn't come the natural speed that a small larva does come, like a nil nymph or aquatic insect comes to its mouth, that'll trigger something, he'll spit that out that much quicker. So that's the key to using such fine lines. Hmm. Never thought about that. So they just go up and just inhale, inhale it. That and if it doesn't go from point A to point B, the speed it should, with a restricted line, 
then uh, you won't you won't get as many big bluegill. Huh. And you won't get as many bluegill, period. The bait we're using is a larva, actually a fly larva, or a maggot, if you will. The flat end is where you hook it. There's a flap of membrane there to hook through that's tough, and you can catch a number of fish on one maggie. Oh, you can see how lightweight it is. It's tough to break the surface tension of the water. The first split shot is, well, it's even smaller than number nine shot in a shotgun shell. That's followed by split shots that are, oh, say, like size four. You don't need as much weight with such a small hook and one pound test line. And the bobber, well, it's as light as a feather, but it's extremely sensitive to let you know when a bluegill sucks in that little maggie. When you fish like this, you have to concentrate every second on that bobber, looking for the slightest unnatural movement. Now there it is, a bluegill just sucked in the maggie. See that? Right. That's yeah. a bite. Yep. It's a fade away. Yep. Didn't, he didn't even pull it under, it just faded away. Without that bobber, we wouldn't have a fish on the ice. Let's take a look at that bobbing. You hardly see it. Then the bobber unnaturally drifts to the side. That odd movement telegraphs the message to us that a bluegill has sucked in the bait. Now that was a fixed bobber, but here's a small slip bobber on the same rig. There it is. See it? Yep. Yep. Oh! Got the gill. In the lip with the small hook. Mm. Now this, uh, this is an eater, I think. This rig almost always catches the fish in the upper lip. Easy to remove. But let's take a look at the different types of bobber movement, starting with the slide bite. The bobber only moves to the side. This indicates a bluegill sucked in the maggie from an inch or two away, and the bobber is adjusting itself over the fish. You can see there's no wind pushing the bobber. It appears to move by itself. That's when you want to set the hook. And you set it right away. Don't wait. Oh, all right, there we go. Got a good one here. A fish is there virtually every time. He's pretty decent. Always hooked right up there in the upper lip. Like I said, set the hook quickly and you've got him in the upper lip. Another kind of bite that you'll see is the straight take bite. After you jiggle the bait, the bobber might go down just a little. That's a fish. Watch. There we go. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Nice one. Well, that does a real nice one. Ooh. Come on out, line. Come on out. Ooh. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> you may have hooked that muskrat trap. Real, yeah. <laughs> oh, nice one. Look at that. Oh, that's beautiful. Wow. That's beautiful. Right in the lip. The tiny hook does its job when you do yours, but you have to pay attention, especially for the next bite. Now, this occurs if a fish swims up when it's sucking in the bait. The bobber lifts. See that? Yeah, that was a fish. You have to really be on your toes to spot this kind of bite. Once you see it, you'll remember it. The fish pulls in the maggie from above, lifts the split shot, and the bobber pops up. This often indicates a big fish. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Nice one. Well, that does a real nice. Ooh. Come on. Oh, oh, man. I thought I lost him for a second. Craig is quiet because he knows this is a beauty. Yeah, he's nice. He's real nice. Real, real nice. Wow. Oh. 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 Is that a crappie or is that a yeah, crappie? Crappie. When he took that in, that float just lifted up. All he did was lift bite it. Is and that a crappie? At, look at that. And look at how he's hooked. Oh yeah, right that, in the lip. That is something else. Now that, that is something else. That is nice. He didn't make any fishing or any And that sensitive float made all the difference. And how deep were you? I was only fishing maybe about five foot. Five he foot? Was, he was suspended. Right in this hole get, right get here? Get your hook down there, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> This crappie was 13 and a half inches, sucked in the tiny maggot, and Craig hooked him in the membrane inside his upper lip. Small hooks like this can catch on the inside of the mouth and hold well enough to land the fish on that light line. That's all you need to put fish on the ice. You know, it's also amazing that such big fish go after such small baits, but that's what they eat most of the time. 
Don Harris, who owns this pond, asks that we put the big crappies back. All right, let's get them in there. Don is trying to cultivate big crappies in his pond, but he said we can keep all the bluegills we want for a meal, and we definitely had plans for these bluegill. It's gonna make a great mess for the table, and what a ball we had catching them. <laughs> Can't imagine, Craig, all of this on the little teeny maggots with little teeny number 18 hooks. Yep, and they're real sensitive floats, that's the key. That you, you know, you'll, they'll see on the tape that that float will do a number of things. I mean, it'll slide across the hole, go under, lift up, whatever that float does. It's a fish, and if, once people understand that, it'll just be amazing the amount of fish people are gonna catch. You can just have a ball with that. And of course, one of the keys to the success here was Don Harris, our old buddy, Fur, his nickname. <laughs> once again, Fur, thanks a lot for letting us use your pond. This, this pond can't be more than, isn't even an acre. What, half acre, something like that? Well, you're gonna have to guard this carefully. I think you're right, Freddy. Of course, that, that goose <laughs> is gonna take care of it up there, I think. <laughs> but, oh, what a great day. Great day, great company, and great fish. Pan fishing, what fun it is and how great they taste on the table. That's why they call them pan fish. But if you want goose bumps when you're fishing or, or spearing, you can go for pike or muskie in Michigan in the winter. A lot of people get them mixed up, but they really shouldn't. Look, a northern pike here on top has a dark body with white bean-shaped spots. Now, on the other hand, a muskie has a lighter body with dark spots. This is a Great Lakes muskie. A northern muskie has faint bars, but it's dark markings on a light body for a muskie, light markings on a dark body for a northern pike. Now, the Department of Natural Resources hybridizes these two species, will cross them in the hatchery, produces what's called a tiger muskie. Very distinctive tiger-like bars on the side of that muskie. We have a map in our current Outdoor Digest magazine that shows where the trophy 20-pound plus tiger muskies were taken around the state since 1984. The top county, western side of the lower peninsula, Mason County, with six. Four trophy tiger muskies have been reported from Muskegon County and three each from Alger County, Houghton County in the UP, and Otsego County. Now, these trophy muskies are also taken in other counties throughout the state. You can see our map, one or two entries. But we're going to kick off our trophy book with the only tiger muskie since 1984, trophy tiger muskie, reported from Presque Isle County. <laughs> From Grand Lake in Presque Isle County, Dave Jackson from Lake caught this 45-incher on a sucker minnow, fishing a tip-up at 11.30 a.m. on the 22nd of February. Now here's a crazy catch. Dennis Knighty from Garden City was fishing Kent Lake for bluegills. He had his ice fishing pole laying on the ice. It started sliding around. He grabbed it and landed a 32-inch carp. That fish gave him a 20-minute battle. Another weird catch. A bullhead on a minnow through the ice. 14-year-old Bill Herman from Ferndale caught it from Oakland County's Lakeville Lake in January. White spots, it's a pike, a 41 and a half incher. Roy Kenny from Sparta caught it on a minnow from Kent County's Indian Lake in January. Ron Cassizzi from Lincoln Park caught this 41 incher from Lake St. Clair fishing a shiner on a tip-up in January. And here's another tip-up pike. 44 inches, 21 pounds, Shamrock Lake in Clare County. Alfred Walworth from Clare caught it in January. In our hunting awards, Huron County produced this eight point buck with a 21 inch spread. Tim Gordon from Bad Axe took it a week after the season opened. Check out the points on this one, 19 altogether. A 27 and a half inch spread, Jim Kirby from Flint got it from Genesee County on November 20th. Now here's a massive rack held by Beth Sharp from Gregory. A 10 point with a 20 and a half inch spread taken on opening day with her 20 gauge. Beth has quite a story. Well, open in the morning, uh, about 15 to 8, I guess it was. I went out about 30 feet from my house. And I stood there and he chased two does by him. First shot was about 250 feet away. Got him in the heart, first one. He ran right towards my neighbor. The neighbor uh, later said that he shot twice at the head and missed it. And when I get back there, my neighbor had him hooked up his truck. Oh. And we had a few words and 
he's finally uh, admitted it was my deer after I showed him. And Did you have to pin him or anything? No. No, you didn't? <laughs> Arm wrestle him forward or nothing? No. We just uh, agreed it was my deer, so... The biggest deer of her life. I'm glad she spoke up. That's what it takes sometimes. If she had kept quiet, Beth Scharf might not have attained the honor of being our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Buck Hunter of the Week. In the Outdoor Digest, we often run an opinion poll to find out what Outdoors Club members think about various current issues. Now, while this poll isn't scientific, I think it does reflect the attitudes of the majority of sportsmen who the Outdoors Club represents. And in our October-November poll, people could put more than one answer to a question, which is why sometimes the answers total up more than 100%. But I wanted to find out how our members regarded themselves in relation to guns and hunting, overwhelmingly as pro-hunters, 91%, while 72% said they considered themselves to be pro-gun. Non-hunter, neutral gun, and anti-gun were minimal, with no anti-hunters responding. Now, that's good. I asked which so-called animal rights statements they agreed with. Humans have a right to treat animals humanely. Animals don't have rights, only humans do. Or animals have equal rights to that of humans. Now, 71% said humans are superior. 26% said only humans have rights, and 2% said animals have equal rights to humans. Now what about environmentalists? 63% said environmentalists are largely non-sportsmen who tend to overlook the concerns of hunters and fishermen. 55% said environmentalists tend to carry their concerns to an extreme. 20% said they're providing a service to society, and only 4% said environmentalists are mainly sportsmen who have broadened their concerns. Now, what do Outdoors Club members think of themselves as being? Conservationists, environmentalists, or preservationists? Well, 85% wanted to be labeled conservationists. 16% considered themselves environmentalists, and 13% didn't mind the preservationist label. Then, on the subject of the DNR, I asked what their attitude is regarding the DNR's dysfunctional computerized hunting and fishing licensing system, which doesn't allow for cross-checking of passbooks and can't identify individuals from their passbook numbers. 73% felt the DNR is manipulating statistics for political purposes. 69% felt the DNR is letting sportsmen down and only 3% said they don't have a problem with the DNR's dysfunctional licensing system. On the subject of a license fee increase, only 1% said a significant increase is needed, 11% said a modest increase would be okay, 50% of our club members who responded said they're against a license fee increase, and 67% agreed with my proposal that license fees ought to be rolled back to match what sportsmen are currently receiving for their money. You know, the Public Service Commission makes Consumers Power and Mishcon and other utilities refund money to customers when they overcharge them. You know, we get these checks in the mail all the time. So why shouldn't the DNR be required to refund money to sportsmen when they use our license money for things other than fish and game management? Makes sense to me. Now let's take a look at some outdoor headlines, some legislative news from this week. Representative Jerry Bartnick introduced a bill two weeks ago that's called a wanton waste bill, making it illegal to shoot a game animal and leave it in the woods or waste the edible skeletal meat of a game animal. That's a good bill that's consistent with ethical conservation practices and one I've called for for several years. Just today, that bill passed the House of Representatives 95 to nothing, and it's on its way to the Senate. Yesterday, Representative Jerry Bartnick's committee passed a bill introduced last June by Representative Robert Bender from Middleville requiring that scent companies list their true ingredients on the bottles for health and safety reasons as well as to prevent fraud. Naturally, the scent companies testified against this truth and labeling requirement, but the bill passed Representative Bartnick's committee unanimously and hopefully will be voted on by the full House next week. The libel lawsuit against me and the TV show by Buck Stop Lure Company is scheduled for trial beginning Tuesday the 4th. Any journalist who wants to keep tabs on the progress can call the Outdoors Club Lawsuit Hotline 501 We'll let you know what testimony is expected day by day. So give us a call before driving all the way to the district court in Stanton. I've always maintained that the scent product should list the ingredients on the label so you know what you're buying. I mean, heck, Kathy Beitler always tells us the ingredients she uses in her recipes. 
We've got a chowder recipe called basil seafood chowder from Patricia Hibbs. And this actually does have a lot of seafood in it. It's got uh, shrimp and crab and everything else, plus perch. And you're going to make, um, it's actually like a gumbo. It's got stewed tomatoes and quite a bit of garlic. And this is just kind of diced. And then a lot of basil. It calls for a half a cup mm-hmm. of basil. But right? it is a lot. Yep, and it seems like it'd be overly strong, but it really isn't. Onions? And, and, and okra. Okra. I like <laughs> okra. Yeah. I really do, but a lot of people don't. But that's what makes a gumbo recipe, Right, supposedly. exactly. And then just some um, uh, like smaller size shrimp, right? Mm-hmm. And then um, crab meat. And that's all that goes into this. And, it, now, you know, the thing is, it lo- actually looks pretty good right now. It right. Does. I mean, these ingredients, one at a time, as you were putting them in there... But when you cook this recipe down, I mean, look, oh, look at that good-looking perch. And it perch. does cook down together. It cooks right. down together, and it it really doesn't look. <laughs> you, you, you know what I no, mean, No, exactly. Kat? It looks better like this before it, it cooks. It looks a lot better, but after <laughs> it's cooked, you know, we really had to coax Charlie Keenan into giving us his comment, but I knew something was up. What? Come on, Charlie. Oh, this, this isn't one that I, <laughs> that I would file under the category of super-duper. <laughs> Well, I tell you, <laughs> I, I don't think we could enter it in any beauty contest either. <laughs> you know, what did you think, Kath, as you were putting this together? Um, Knowing I it, kept saying, I hope this tastes better than it looks. <laughs> you know, and it does. It really does. The basil comes through in the It tomatoes. does. It does, but we, it, this should be renamed. Mm-hmm. I think it should be something like peekaboo soup. <laughs> Eat yeah, in the it, dark. It, yeah, <laughs> a Cur- candlelight. Yeah, yeah. courage yeah. soup. Courage yeah. soup. That's a good one. This is this mm-hmm. is the, it, this is a, a nice recipe. For it's those, mild. It's for different. those people who who if you don't like uh, shrimp, right? You should try this recipe because you can't taste any of the shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can taste it. I think you can taste the shrimp and the crab and mm-hmm. the perch, but um, it's really mild. I'm surprised at Which, how mild it was. This is for somebody who likes seafood gumbo. Mm-hmm. It really likes, you know, is into seafood Cajun yep. and all that type of thing. It'd be great with the wild, would, wild rice or something like that in it. They would really enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And I think that any parent that can get their kid to take one bite of this, <laughs> we ought to give them a prize. Yeah, they get a medal. <laughs> <laughs> I can see him pushing it away with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> hey, just because we joke about these recipes, don't take it that seriously. They taste great. That seafood chowder is a good one. We're going to give you the address in just a moment where you can write and get a copy. Get outdoors if you can this weekend. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Is that a coffee? Look at that. And look at how he's hooked. Oh, yeah, right in the lip. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, we'll bring you a report from Perchville at Tawas, a terrific recipe for fish patties. You'll see the progress on our new wildlife museum. And, of course, we'll have an update on the buck stop libel lawsuit because I'll be in court all week. That's the life of an investigative reporter. But Michigan Outdoors will go on, and I'll be here. So join me next week right here on Public TV. All right, let's get him in there.